All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Claire Foster and I am the events coordinator here at Type Books. And I'm so happy to welcome you tonight to the virtual launch of Judy Blame's obituary, Writings on Fashion and Death by Derek McCormack, which was recently published by Pilot Press. Um, tonight, Derek is gonna be in conversation with Natalie Atkinson and both are joining in from their Toronto abodes. Um, this event I know has many people tuning in from all over, but I want to let everyone know that Type Books is an independent bookstore in Toronto, uh, Canada, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that Type Books, where we are selling this book, is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 and signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we encourage you to reflect on the history of the land from which you are listening and tuning in as well. Finally, I will clarify, even though we're all pros at this point, that this is a webinar, which means that while you can see us, we cannot see you. So please feel free to put in any questions you have in the Q&A bar down below at the bottom of the screen or comment in the chat, and we will do our best to get to all of them before the end of the event. And shortly, I'll put links uh, to buy copies of the book in the chat as well. Derek McCormack's recent novels are are Castle Faggot and The Well-Dressed Wound, both published by Semiotext. He writes about art and fashion for Art Forum and other publications. He lives in Toronto. Natalie Atkinson is a culture journalist and film critic, a columnist for The Globe and Mail, and she freelances widely from Noir City, Zoomer, and Fashion Magazine to CNN Style and BBC Culture. She's also the host of Designing the Movies, the film series where art, direction, and costume are the lens for analysis. Natalie was previously the National Post award-winning style and design editor, and as such was Derek's editor. Um, the two have been friends for more than 20 years, most of them spent talking about fashion, and I can't wait to turn it over to them as well. So thank you all. Um, I will be back to communicate questions at the end of the event. And um, thank you so much. Take it away. Thank you, Claire. So are you going to read for us now first, uh, Derek? Is that, I is will. that the plan? Okay. I will read for a couple of minutes. Uh, the book is Judy Blame's obituary that um, uh, so I want to acknowledge, I want to thank Pilot for getting this beautiful Judy Blame brooch and trust Blue Judy Blame for letting us reproduce it. Um, I'm going to read from the essay about Judy Blame, which is called The Shit Necklace. I'm going to read part of it. Shit. Judy Blame is dead. Blame was a brilliant jeweler of the punk era. Some of his jewelry was shit. There's a photo I love, blame in a blame, a necklace made of shit, a bib necklace featuring fake turds cascading down his chest. This is what fashion calls a statement piece. What was the statement? That fashion is shit? That shit is fashion? Who would say such a thing? Le shit? The shit? What was that necklace called? Fake shit is funny. It doesn't look like shit. It looks like, it looks like something that's trying to look like shit. Judy Blame's necklace wasn't jewelry. It was something that looked like joke jewelry, a fuck you to fakeness, a fuck you from fakeness. Wasn't that what punk was? Whatever Judy Blame did, he made jewelry, yes, but he also styled shoots, singers, and fashion shows, was magic to me. I've been a fan forever since finding his work in the magazines that I memorized as a teenager, The Face, ID, Blitz. He was a punk, which is what I wanted to be. He was a jeweler, which is what I wanted to be. He was a faggot. I'm a faggot too, though I think he was better at it. I wanted to be his kind of punk, but had to settle for writing. I think of words as brooches pinned to paper. I think of sentences as shit necklaces. There are 14 turds in this sentence. So this story is for Judy. In 1977, the year of the Silver Jubilee, the year the Sex Pistols got busted playing on a boat on the Thames, he was 17 and squatting in London. He wore the clothes that punks wore. He went down to seditionaries and bought bondage pants. 
He wore the jewelry that punks wore, safety pins, zippers, badges. He stuck them to his clothes. He stuck them to his body. He wrapped a zipper around his head. It made him look like he'd had a new brain put in, like Vivian Westwood was his surgeon. Punk created Judy Blame, and he created Punk too. He took its tropes and twisted them, then twisted them some more. He screen printed safety pins onto badges. He bound badges in tartan and then speared them with safety pins. He mudlarked. It sounds scatological. It means he rummaged for treasures in riverbanks, especially the banks of the Thames. The treasures, bones, bottle caps, broken bits of crockery, he transformed into finery, bijoux de la boue. Toys, charms, pinchbeck chains, he collected all sorts of crap. He combined it in beautiful objet that he wore when he went clubbing or to tea. It didn't matter what it was, a newspaper headdress or cutlery tucked into a hat band or a cap so encrusted with buttons and beads that it looks like, a mem like memory wear. He looked brilliant like nothing before him. He looked like Judy Blaine. That's the taste. Okay. Well, can we can we re rewind a bit? I mean, just um, the background on on the two of us is that we worked together at a small local bookstore in Toronto in the later '90s. And at the time, I of course did not know anything about your fashion side. You were just someone I worked with. So, can you? What's your origin story? Like, how do you discover ID in the face and Judy Blame and Carol Pope and stuff in, in this smaller town you grew up in? Um, well, I, uh, I was through reading, you know, I've always I've always read about fashion and things I love before I got to see them or hold them or buy them. So I was fortunate to have parents that subscribed to um, all the Toronto dailies. Um, and at the time, they all had substantial I guess both of them had substantial style sections. My favorite being the Globe where David Livingston was the editor. Um, and I would, you know, I would pick up, there were magazines you could see at dentists and doctor's office and I was always at the doctor's office. So what I, what I came to love in magazines was the where to buy in the back page. You know, I'd memorize what is Hazelton Lanes, what is Atomic Age on Queen Street. And I lived, I grew up close enough to Toronto uh, unlike you, that it was, you could drive in for a concert. My parents drove in to see movies or to do back to school shopping. And uh, so I just begged to the, go to these places I read about. And um, ID and the face and Blitz, uh, when they came up, uh, every hipster store had to have them, not only clothing boutiques, but record boutiques. So when you went and, you know, when I could save up and buy a record, I was also more, I was also, I would also buy a magazine. In fact, I was more apt to buy a magazine because um, something about fashion I love are the words. I, and that applies to the clothes too. Like I love labels. I love care labels. I love the shopping bags they come in. I love, uh, everything comes through words first. So words are what I wear, as I say in the piece. Um, uh, and then eventually you get to see the shit in real life. So, and then you, you do start to, to get to see the stuff in real life. I mean, peppered throughout our, our sort of small autobiographical mentions of pilgrimages. I think that's yes. the right word to say, made to places. Um, was, I get the sense though music is partly the gateway drug too, because Carol Pope, you know, as your first sort of style icon and also musical crush uh, yeah. is kind of the conduit too, right? Yeah, you for sure. You interviewed her at age 12. Which... I did in grade eight. I just found the tape for it. I'm oh, afraid, you... I, I mean, I don't have a cassette player and I'm afraid it'll turn to dust because we're so fucking old. Um, but it was grade eight and we had to interview a, a someone about um, power and stress, I think was the, and anyway, I asked for Carol Pope. My teacher arranged it somehow. It, it, it was the most hilarious and frightening thing um, because she didn't pull any punches. I was a kid and she talked about sex and drugs and rock and roll. Um, so there would have been Bowie too. There would have been other musicians and in that age you started to see videos. So that would be another route uh, to fashion. Um, but for sure, Rough Trade, the Canadian band. I don't know why, I don't know when the label came out, Rough Trade in the UK. And I don't know why Rough Trade, the band didn't challenge it in court. I don't know, I don't huh. understand. But that would have been the first record sleeve where, you know, styling by general idea, clothes by, where you know where there were Toronto addresses, I could like Bowie, but I wasn't gonna be on King's Road anytime soon. But right. Rough Trade was a chance. You know, it was somewhere that I could sort of picture in my mind. And then, as my 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 parents like to travel, so when we went to New York and 
1983, they said, where do you want to go? Um, and I said, this store, Comme des Garçons, and they let me. Um, it, they were used to me at that point. And, resigned. They were resigned to me. <laughs> Uh, so I know you're, uh, you, you keep things, you archive things. So, uh, what are you wearing? Just, I, you know, we're talking about fashion, so I need to know because you write a lot about things that you have acquired that how they're meaningful from the eighties. Yeah. What are you wearing? I, <laughs> well, it depends. Underwear <laughs> as always. Oh, you, um, the clothes, uh, I'm wearing a, a Gucci rubber shirt, rubberized shirt from 1987 that I bought in Toronto. I haven't had it on since about 1988. Um, I'm about three times the size. There's no way I'm standing up. It doesn't, it, there's nothing that could get me to stand up and show you any more of this shirt. But there is like a rubber patch that's modeled after Planet of the Apes. This is JPG on the front. Uh, basically it's like a halter top on me at this point. So I need to keep this camera right where it is. In the same spot, okay. This, this part of me is pretty much like it was hunchback and um, under under muscled as it was in 87, but the rest of me is different. Okay, well, well, before we started, there was something else that you, that, that oh. comes through, it's in at least three of your essays. You're right. So I also was gonna wear my Stephen Sprouse jacket, which really doesn't fit at all. And this rubberized shit is so hot. Um, but I do have my Jean-Paul Gaultier Brunswick star from the two, um, uh, Too Fast to Live, Too Young to Die, which is an homage to Westwood and McLaren. Um, I bought this at If Boutique in, Bo in Soho in um, the mid 80s, I guess, 84. Okay. Um, if I forget where If Boutique was then, it's still around. And I've learned a lot just by going into that store. I, when I think of the things I should have bought and didn't, but I've always made the wrong decisions about everything, school, careers, clothes. So. Okay, well, so I know your love of Sprouse. That is something I know. And that's mm -hmm. a, you know, and when you used to write for the National Post, the section that I edited, because I didn't really edit you, let's be real. You just kind of filed things and I was like, okay, great, let's make it fit somehow. I don't know. You know, one of the stories that you did write was about Sprouse and the origins of Dayglow when Sprouse did, they did that Sprouse revival collection at, at Vuitton, I guess, yeah. which is not in, which is not in the book. I don't, so no. I'm curious about your process. Like what, what were this, the, the criteria or what, what did you think about when you were choosing what you did want to include in the 30 essays? I actually regret not putting that Sprouse essay in. I, I, my, my criteria, I, I, I said to myself, there has to be something in this that seems, um, there has to be a hook for me, something I said that surprises me or um, that I, I still, that I'd forgotten that I found interesting. Um, uh, or something maybe related to my fiction. Uh, I, I wish I had done the Sprouse because, well, I was a, I loved Sprouse and I loved Debbie Harry. I saw Blondie, I saw Duran Duran opening for Blondie. I forget when I'll, I'll I, she, it was at the CNE and she lost a shoe and mm -hmm. then she threw it in the crowd. She was angry, I guess, at herself or the band. Um, it reminds me of one of the times I saw Susie and everyone was pressed up against the stage and she walked along the edge and just um, methodically kicked people in the head one by one, which I just loved. Uh, and if I weren't wearing glasses and afraid to go to the front, I would have been right there getting her boot. Um, and in retrospect, the Sprouse piece, uh, it was interesting because of Day Glow. And in fact, it really ties in with my love of haunted houses and Halloween, because I think I worked that into the article that, mm -hmm you know, how this thing, it was developed and used for military purposes, but in fact, the first commercial use of Dayglow was in magic shows and in this haunted themed restaurant in San Francisco. So I can't believe I left that out. Um, but there is kind of a logic to, I mean, it's a rhizomatic logic, like it's not linear that they're sort of, and it's not chronological, No, mostly not, where you are circling the same idea three or four times in different ways. That's under a sign different of how sizes, right? That is a sign of how stunted I am, though. No, you know that basically I've been circling the toilet bowl on the same stuff for 25 years, for 30, 45 years. Um, there is a logic. I, 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 I've loved the same stuff for a long time, and I go through periods of not loving stuff. But I, I'm, I know now that I'll go back to it. You know, there are periods when I'm not interested in fashion at all, as you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, people will say, what did you think of this show? And I'm, mm -hmm. I haven't thought of fashion in ages. 
but I always go back, you know, I'm like, if Tom Waits said that, you know, like piano players are like old dogs, they just go back to the same chords that they know. And I'm like that. Um, but you have to do it here in 800 words or less, right? In each yeah. of these was sort well, of- Well, I will say, Natalie, like a lot of people say how, when they read the book, they say, how are these things published in a national newspaper? And it's a good question. Like, how, how did you, how did you manage to get, I mean, it wasn't just me. We wrote about stuff that really interested us and that was perverse. Yes. Or niche. I mean, that's the interesting thing about the National Post for people who are maybe not in Canada is sort of occupies the sort of position of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. It's much more the business paper and pro-business and more conservative in every possible way. But sort of there was a lack of editorial interference or oversight, maybe. But also there was sort of a confidence in the people that it had chosen to the in the taste of the people who were working in those sections. And I wasn't even in there in the heyday of the budgets and everything. And I guess for me, asking you to do things was often just, we would get offered, you know, a, I sent you on a number of junkets, you know, or to oh, interviews when um, I still always tried to get you to Paris. I'm sorry, I never managed that. But, you know, where, you know, it's kind of this dog and pony show, like, you know, that everyone's going to get the same canned thing. And so I've been thinking about that a little bit in terms of that, the, the, the fakery that's involved. It's like the, um, it's like the British fox hunt, right? Everyone pretends they're going hunting and they feel like they're journalists and they go in and they're getting the scoop, but they all like, you know, there's the dogs that are trained to get the, you know, pheasants and like, it's not, or the fox, it's not in any way authentic. And so into that, I send Derek McCormick, who's going to come back with a pink flamingo for me. He's somehow going to find something else in that forest. <laughs> I think well, that's know, kind the of the attitude that I had. Maybe. <laughs> Well, God bless you, because I would go on those junkets and I would always look at the wrong thing, notice the wrong thing, hear the wrong thing. And I would, and I guess the last, I mean, I really loved the one um, meeting Nicholas Gasquier. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was so cute. And I remember, um, um, I remember that, that his security guard, his bouncer guy at the door, I was told had been the legendary bouncer at Gauthier's shows. I mean, the really big shows of the early 80s and mid 80s. Um, but I remember going to the, the Margiela H&M one in New York City mm -hmm. that you sent me to. And it was on a whole different scale. One, I loved Margiela and suddenly it was in Diesel's hands and you couldn't mention him, which pissed me off. Um, second of all, it was preposterous in this enormous building. I remember seeing Kanye and stars. I guess I'd never seen that, but I do remember at the hotel, uh, it was my first exposure to like influencers and mm. Instagram people that I, I had always, I had always known fashion journalists. Like we knew David Livingston and he was always a slob. I mean, he, he sometimes looked nice, but he, that was really his last concern. I mean, the real concern was a story and sentences. And, um, I remember seeing those, oh, I always called them the Bar Barnum and Bailey twins from Toronto. I don't know what their real names are, mm -hmm. but they're Instagram people. But um, yeah, they had real power and they were catered to. Now that said, he, Geskier did send everyone a necklace after. I guess he didn't expect a male. Oh no, I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, I never wore it, but I was so happy to get a freebie. I can't tell you. There's something ghoulish about that. I, I wanted to talk a bit about that because it, the sort of, the, I mean, Heat Margiela is still alive, but has sold his company and all of these things are being made under his agus, you know, like under the, under his name and trying to pull motifs from stuff. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about, cause we, we do talk shit about this all the time, um, <laughs> is, is the, this idea of this sort of, does it appeal to you? This sort of ghoulish picking of the cadaver of a dead designer, like Balenciaga, who very famously wrote when he hung up his, his shingle in 68 my I want my name to die with me if I'm not designing stuff it it's like it, it does it's not Balenciaga and yet it gets revived like Hollywood does right intellectual yeah. property everyone's mining things for intellectual Scaparelli your other favorite yeah is that kind of appealing to you in a perverse way that we're picking at the cadavers of these people I mean I think that's a great point I think as a rule yeah necrophilia is a big bonus for me um anything ghoulish as soon as you say ghoulish it can't recast it in this really sexy light to me <laughs> um in real life you know I go back and forth 
I, I really, I really do. And I, I, you know, Balenciaga is an interesting case. I loved the Couture show. I really hated the show after that. Scaparelli, uh, Marco Zanini did it and I was really interested. And in I'm in general interested uh, in what they're doing, although more so the embroidery and the jewelry. Everyone seems to love the jewelry though. Mm -hmm. um, someone just asked me in an interview, this really nice woman, if I could make a perfume right now, if I could create it in one second, what would it be? And I said, Daniel Roseberry's Dingleberry by Scaparelli. So I'm, I'm gonna see if that makes it into print. He's so, super cute. So I'm, um, and he's talented, but there, I'm, I'm, I go back and forth between being interested and then also being a purist and thinking, I, I love uh, Balenciaga. I mean, the man, I love the severity mm -hmm. of his thought and his clothes. And so when he says this goes to the grave with me, I'm with him too. Like, I think it's kind of ghastly to mm -hmm. constantly resurrect these houses. Um, but what do I know? Like, I didn't think that Margiela should continue. And I remember talking to um, what's his face from Diesel, um, Renzo. Ren yeah. And getting stopped short because I mentioned Margiela's name. And I just found that so awful, you know, that I was allowed to mention H&M and John Galliano, but I couldn't mention. And I just realized the you know, the, how the parting of the ways was so awful and it was awful for him and his team and it was awful between them. And um, so uh, they've, I don't know, if you say you're from Balenciaga or Scaparelli, you have a lot to prove. Yeah. Well, you know, I look at the sum of these pieces together because uh, I read them all. I, I had been sort of picking at them and I, you know, I edited some of them and I was really familiar with some and not with others. But then I, I sat down and just read the whole thing through and it does feel like a spirograph, you know? <laughs> Like it does. I mean, if you think of the different color inks and it's sort of, it's the same, but it's, there's a different curve here or an inflection there. It's really interesting, but there is kind of this macabre air that kind of permeates the whole thing. It, it has a kind of funereal feeling to it. And I, yeah. I mean, Mugler, when you wrote about his exhibition had not died yet, but for all intents and purposes, the work that he had done for which he was being celebrated and exhibited was behind him. Yeah. And Gautier, you could argue the same, even though it's, you know, he's very much made a break from designing. Yeah. So, I mean, it feels to me like your relationship to those designers and those subjects is maybe in the past too. Yeah, I think, um, I think most things in my life are in the past though. I think writing might be in my past. Um, so. For sure, the fashion, the things I've done for Art Forum have all been obituaries in a way. Um, the, the blame, the Gauthier, the Mugler. Um, yeah, and it's kind of a it's kind of a tombstone on my childhood, adolescence, adulthood. And it's also um, it's also, yeah, for sure a fascination with death that runs through my work. And I think was quite campy until I got cancer and then it got quite serious and angry. And um, I started to title books things like Castle Faggot, you know, so that no one would review it or give it a, uh, you know, that people were predisposed, but, or The Well-Dressed Swoon, I think, which had Margelle in it was quite an angry book too. Um, mm -hmm. There's maybe, again, it's maybe just reading it, knowing the kind of process too that you go through, but there's a terseness to certain um, profiles or interviews. And there's a way, I still haven't figured out how you do it, because I would love to learn how to do it, where you somehow totally take the piss out of the person that you are profiling. Like I'm thinking of the Killian story, for example. Oh, the Killian Hennessy. Where all you do is describe that he's wearing a black suit and he's from Paris. And somehow the way in which you order the words, it's really clear to the reader. And that's why I kind of, I mean, that's why I love that. Like I'm thinking of the whole package, right? The newspaper on a Saturday morning and you've got people who are accidentally stumbling across something and might see a paragraph that might, make them want to read the whole article like that's that happenstance and so there's these wonderful moments that you create that people can discover that was one of the reasons why I always wanted to assign you these things well it's very yeah. nice because a couple of people astonished me with their stupidity and I, I I didn't feel it was fair to just say that but I remember the day I met Prenza Schooler and one I was pissed off that Jeannie Becker purposely went over in her time so everyone else got screwed for time I mean it was so strategic she always did that I felt um because I was always delayed waiting for her and then they said these insane things and to me Killian Hennessy was um 
that way. I couldn't believe this person had a PhD from the Sorbonne and I, on Baudelaire. And I said, what was Baudelaire's favorite fragrance? And he said, oh, I don't know. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, in retrospect, I should have been kinder because I've forgotten every fucking thing that I ever knew. And I've, but um, he was young and he was cute and rich and I feel he should have known. But I'm glad I didn't just slam people um, because I always found the circumstances interesting and because fashion is really a world that I do not know. I really do not know the world of perfume of fashion. I don't know what it is to exist in it. I'm really a, you know, I'm really a writer in the fashion world. And when I'm in, and when I'm in right, but when I'm in writing, I like to think of myself as a fashion writer. When I'm in the art world, I like to think of myself as a writer. I'm always another place where I am. Um, I would like to say a couple of things though. One, about the cancer, I, I said to Kevin Hege the other day that I can't believe I had cancer and I didn't immediately sell an idea for a cancer memoir because it was like the one time in my life I would have been guaranteed good reviews or reviews at all. Anyway, I totally fucked that up. Two, you did teach me a lot. You and David taught me, I mean, David taught me when a lot of the essays, not some of the essays in here are were, were uh, commissioned by David and he wouldn't let me write in first person which was a hugely valuable thing that I stopped mm -hmm. doing as soon as I could but it's hard mm -hmm. not to write in first person um and you taught me yeah. to ask questions you know like I remember going I wrote a piece which isn't in the book on um, mascots people who walk and parade in mascots and go to sports right. scenes and I just didn't ask the right questions once they said that the masks were full of bacteria I was just interested in <laughs> what bacteria were growing. Like, I just wanted to culture the masks. And you were like, could you just talk to someone who's actually worn this mask in front of a crowd? Like, can they hear? Can they see? And I never, I mean, those practical things, I, I, I just forgot them, but you, you know, you were really good at saying like, Derek, really be present and think of the person that you're writing about. Okay, but there's a point, you know, and I did, I looked up some of the bylines that you did early on, you know, before I was editing you or just early, like in the globe and other places where you're doing much more of a tradition, you start off doing much more of a traditional who, what, where, when, why, like who are like reporting the story. Yeah. And then there's a point at which you become kind of detached and that becomes like an umbilical cord that, that is less and less. And yet you are still telling the story, but just in a completely, the same thing with the spirograph or the rhizome, you know, the Delusian rhizome where it, there's no point of origin, but you, ha you have to er like, you know, everything kind of has to be read. Every sentence matters. And I feel like that was your trickery because, you know, typically as a journalist, you file and then sometimes they just lob off the bottom two paragraphs or, it, or you know, they, they cut off two in the middle and it still has to work. And that was your way of kind of, flouting the system and making it impossible for that to happen. I sort of feel like there's a little bit of Machiavelli, perhaps unconscious in that, but I don't well, know. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, um, what did Kyle call me the other day? Recalcitrant, is that the word? Recalcitrant? Recalcitrant, that's it. Um, yeah, I'm that mm -hmm. and um, I'm perverse. And there is a point where for sure, writing the journalism was a testing ground for fictional things, for sentences I would use in fiction, for ideas I would use in fiction. I also do that with interviews and these call, I mean, I did an interview the other day and really it, it, it was a testing ground for how outrageous I could be. Um, uh, so I don't know if that's a good thing in a journalist. I was lucky that I got paid to, ex to experiment in that way. Mm -hmm. um, it was also good for me as someone who is a shut-in basically that I got to go and, I mean, New York is one thing, but I went to Toronto and I saw people and met people I wouldn't, or I mean, I was afraid of. Um, and, but yeah, I, I'm a perverse fashion writer. And, but I, what I liked with you and what I liked with David and what I liked with writing for Nast is that they weren't trend pieces. I wasn't supposed to capture, I wasn't supposed to forecast, you know, I wasn't, um, that the literary was prized. I've always been lucky to write for people for whom the literary is prized and for whom fashion history is prized. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, re I remember discovering or being told about Lois Long's talk of the town pieces, you know, where she would walk through stores in New York and just report what was there and 
um, we love, I love finding stuff like that. We love finding stuff like that. And also realizing how hard it is to write fashion journalism well, you know, to capture its, um, to capture its capriciousness without falling apart as a piece of journalism. I, I miss, I feel like there's, there's less of that. There's a lot of saturation about fashion because fashion has become entertainment. It's just yet another, you know, vertical, but I remember I used to, I, I found an old sort of set of uh, archived bookmarks and from the, my websites not long ago. And there was, you know, elements of style, which I would obsessively for Lynn Yeager's, you know, Village Voice, even though I never, I, I had only been in New York in the late nineties, but before that I was refreshing, you know, I wanted to read it Wednesday night or Thursday morning, that kind of beat. And that was sort of the interesting thing for me was sending you on this beat, right? Where yes, there's all these sort of conceptual things and philosophical aspects of the writing, but it's also a beat. And it's sort of a kind of being part of that, in, being in a community that you're also accountable to in some yes, way you are. and part of. You are. I guess the bad part of that community is that you're really discouraged from writing negative things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of blowback for negative things instantaneously and it's expected that you're positive. But I, I too love Lynn Yeager and I love Bill Cunningham and um, uh, there's still fashion writers I like. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really hard because the, yeah, as you say, it's become entertainment. It's also when I was a kid, I thought that fashion was gay. It was like basically the gay consciousness and that has changed. It's become, the straights have really <laughs> looted <laughs> fag fashion. Yeah. Um, uh, although, you know, fashion to me is like an art of death in a way, so it's okay. You know, it can die a thousand times and it comes back. Um, and Great. the other thing is when it went online, fashion writing lost a lot of its severity. You know, people write too long now is another problem is that, that, that you can keep scrolling down and but people really need to stop three pair, you know, three paragraphs above where it stops. So would you prefer kind of a sustained conversation over time? You know, like seeing someone writing on a beat. I mean, that's what I find is is hard is that these sort of a lot of fashion criticism becomes an occasion. There's an occasion to write about it. And, you know, um, it it's not a regular, you know, twice a week column or kind of sustained conversation with an audience or readers yeah. that's that's incremental. Yeah. It's these I, sort of larger pronouncements or larger explorations. And we've talked about this too, about academia and sort of the melding of academia and cultural criticism as kind of an issue too. But. Yeah, academic writing and fashion just drives me bonkers. But I, 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 I'm with you on that. That's a really, really interesting point that I haven't thought of that even, you know, that I loved reading Kathy Horn, even when I thought she was wrong. Um, I, I could read her regularly. You know, I knew she was going to be there every week or twice a week. Um, it was the same with Bill Cunningham. It, at details. It's the thing I, I, one of the things I like about Rachel Tashian, who's now going to Harper's, is that she writes a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I miss regular engagement. And you're right, I, I, I'm, I'm less overwhelmed by the spectacle of it. I mean, the, the idea of what is a spectacle in fashion is always changing. And when I was young, it was Mugler and Gauthier. And now it's, you know, Kanye and Balenciaga in a stadium. Um, but I love the beat, I love the thought of a beat reporter. I mean, how, I mean, what a great way to learn to write, you know, to have to write, mm -hmm. to have to write all the time and to have to write uh, to a certain word count. Oh, um, yeah. I'm, although I'm lucky my novels are shorter than my essays. Like my yeah. novels are like 8,000 words. So um, word counts don't scare me. I'm always thinking, how can I write fewer words? But, uh, but I, yeah, there's something about the the severity and the um, emergent the the emergency of writing to a small word count that's exciting to me. Well, I'm curious about that because you you know the way your books as physical objects and even on the the arrangement of the words on the page is usually really specific, and you've worked with uh, presses that I think have allowed you input there and and some level of control. And when you're filing to you know you've got or David at back at Elm Street or, or you have no control over what it's going to look like and how it's going to be arranged. And so I, that leads me to the question is what was your approach when you were writing these? Are you treating them like the agony of writing your fiction? 
Or are you treating them much more like commercial kind of for hire and you're less wedded to them in a way? Uh, no, I'm really wedded to them, but I'm, I was resigned to, you know, I love section breaks. I was resigned to everything getting squished together. And I, I sort of learned to deal with it. Um, you know, I, I realized that a, a, cer there, a certain amount of quotation looked good, a certain amount of uh, introduction looked good. Th there's a voice I have in my essays that I really like, which is the voice of just getting it fucking done that I like, because my fiction, I never just fucking get it done. It takes me eight years to write, you know, like something that's as long as someone's recipe, you know, for shortbread. Um, I forget what I was saying. I want to say, I just want to have a shout out to Natalie, who also made me this incredible bottle of Negroni that I'm drinking. So I encourage everyone there to have a Negroni or Boulevardier okay. right there. Um, okay. So one of the things that one of our shared loves, uh, one of our many shared loves is retail. You know, you have all this philosophical stuff and you've studied, you know, Baudelaire and I mean, all different, different sort of philosophical schools of thought that you apply to the fashion and you like to deconstruct the concepts, but you also just really love shit. You just really love like the dusty covered in like the junk. Yeah. And I'm curious about how the last couple of years have been and if that's affected your love of the of fashion now that it's kind of mostly mediated through a screen. Oh, okay. I want to start by saying, I just remember what I was saying, which was that I love Pilot Press. And I love semiotext because they let me do things on the page, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether other people think they make sense. And ECW did for me too. They let me put like red ink for sequins. And, and, and also, I'm sorry, can I just say Western suit, which if you don't have, sorry, it's a collector's item, but it's an actual, it's an actual pattern for a is. Western suit. Look at that. And, and Ian Phillips designed that and Grant Heap yeah. sewed it, I believe. And I write an essay about them in Judy Blame's obituary. And I don't know how many readers I have. I think it's probably a couple dozen, but um, I hope that they try and find those Pot de Chance books because someone needs to do a show or a book about Ian and, and, and Grant when he contributed to it. Um, okay, so Pilot. Oh, so I was gonna say, yeah, it's been weird. I, I do love, you know, since I got sick, I certainly go out less and I have to plan it more. But I really do love groping clothes in stores. And um, when I went to New York, you know, I would indulge myself. But in Toronto, I would go down to the Bay, less so Holtz. Um, but I love touching the Come de Garçon stuff. Um, I love smelling it. I love looking at the hang tags. And um, yeah, it sucks. It sucks the last couple of years has been mediated through the screen, which I'm not super crazy about. I, I love magazines and I love the written word and I like reading the written word, but I, um, it, 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 has, it has been less fun being in a place and in a health situation where I can't go out and see things. Um, Cause there's really, you know, it was really so exciting for me as someone who's basically a nun and asexual to touch clothes. I mean, that was everything. That was my relationships was just like groping a jacket for a couple of minutes and then scurrying out. I sound like a John Waters character, which I sort of am. And you kind of are, you are actually. And I sort I remember running into John Waters at Barney's and talking to him and he was kind of peevish with me. And I, in retrospect, I think, oh, he was doing what I was doing, which was just yeah. feeling up the clothes. I mean, he could afford to buy the suit. Well, there's that great moment in the Joey Arias interview that you did where you, I don't think anyone, it didn't seem to me like anyone had ever asked Joey Arias what he and Klaus Nomi did with the two grand that David Bowie gave them to go shopping. And you asked the question that when they're long gone, people will want to know where did they go shopping and what did they not find and how did they come up with those outfits for Saturday Night Live, right? And you get was, to ask those things. And it was so exciting because I think like a lot of fashion perverts, he remembered exactly the order of the stores they went. I mean, we remember these things, right? Mm -hmm. We remember the feeling of buying something, of finding it on sale, of trying it on. Um, and I remember asking Joey where he got his hair colored because I just didn't know where one did that. I know one could do it at home. I know there's so, but he had professionally uh, that sort of longing that we love is like, where is it? How is it displayed? What is the price? How is it packaged when you leave the store? 
it's all the material culture that I love and that I miss. And I don't have a lot of hope for the future, but I have been daydreaming lately of, lately of paying, like being able to pay retail price on something I really love once more in my life and carrying it out of a store. <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the, what I, there's a couple of things that I really love in the different essays. And one of them that sticks with me is um, you, I don't know if you're quoting Dodie Bellamy, but you, you write about Dodie Bellamy's installation of Kathy Acker's clothing and her wardrobe as sort of autobiography. And you'd mentioned that Kathy Acker, or she mentions that Kathy Acker bought clothes instead of buying art in yeah. the eighties because it was more affordable or accessible. And that sort of leads me to like, can we even afford the things we love anymore? Like, you know, we talk about going on websites and finding things we couldn't buy 20 years ago and how they're so expensive. And Yeah, I have, a, I have less spending money than I did when I was young. Oh no, that might not be true. What might be true is that I was more foolhardy or I mm -hmm. thought I could earn more, um, but I'm more afraid now and, and less in shape to buy the things I like. Yeah. Um, but no, fashion is like, it's such an expensive proposition. It's just yeah. shocking. It's astonishing. And if you're a bargain hunter, it's for sure harder during the pandemic to make a go of it, you know, yeah. to, to, at least it is in Canada. I don't know about other places. Um, but uh, I, you know, I do love going on Grailed. And I, 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 I told you the other week that I've been going on and looking at old Gauthier and Gauthier Jr. And there is stuff on there and I'm sorely tempted. I don't know why I need a red feather ring, but I might pull the trigger. I might do it. I yeah. mean, I, I should have done it because this is basically the only occasion where people are going to see me for the next six months. I should have been wearing it now. I well, you're up. wearing some rings now. I don't usually see you in those. those I know these are, I used to wear these pre-pandemic and then they're old Margiela rings. And then I found that the um, hand sanitizer was destroying i mean they're just nickel or some shit and nickel plated and it was destroying them and then also my my middle finger i'm just like have fatter fingers now and i said to you before oh sorry to give the finger i'm never gonna get this ring off i'm gonna have to use a liter of liquid soap to get this fucking thing off yes well <laughs> that's okay or we'll cut your hand off and you'll be kind of a <laughs> you know or we'll we'll spray you with bacteria i mean that was one of the reading them in together these pieces you know the one of the biggest images that i have coming out of it is that it, the, the way you describe david altmed's um uh, werewolf sculptures as sort of blooming with uh kind of decay and jewelry coming out of them as though they were yes decaying in in a grave with jewelry and then thinking back to the margiela essay you know two essays back with the yeah. bacteria he's spraying and the commonalities there Oh my God, I just forgot about David, how, yeah, the corpses decompose and they make jewelry. I mean, you'd think they make spores, but in mm -hmm. fact, they make jewelry. You also reminded me that I'm really lucky with my publisher, Semiotex, and now with Pilot Press, like Rich at Pilot Press. For those of you who will read Judy Blame's obituary, there, there, like, there are three essays in a row about David Altman. There's mm -hmm. two essays in a row about Margiela and then a million more mentions. And I'm so lucky to have a publisher that it goes against sort of commercial ideas of what a collection should be and that I do revisit them. And sometimes I revisit them in a row and it shows like Derek in 1995, Derek in 2005 and Derek in 2015. And uh, I'm so lucky. Um, but isn't that kind of fashion? I mean, fashion, you know, it's- Yeah, that's it, a great You change point. your mind, you change your mind or you're figuring out what you think about it by writing about it, that whole adage, right? That's a great point. You change your mind and then you come back to your old frame of mind when you don't expect it. I mean, yeah. I mean, part of the fa magic of fashion is when things feel right. And um, that's a whole other conversation, but that's, a, you know, I think it's a super complicated uh, question of when things seem right for the moment, things seem right for you. And that's happened over and over in my writing career. What feels right for now? What fe um, uh, anyway, I feel lucky. And I also have never owned a Judy Blame. I, you know, I would love one day to own a Judy Blame. I don't know how it'll ever happen, but I'm so lucky that like, I could cut out the- Well, you do out. actually, you do own a Judy Blame because didn't you say that you wanted your books to be accessories that you could wear? And so you could wear this. <laughs> I could cut out the cover and just- wear it. <laughs> it is a Judy Blame. I mean, would Judy would, like that if I just pinned cardboard yeah. to me? Maybe. Yeah. Hi, Claire. Hello. Hi. I'm back with some questions, but I think oh, that yeah. I, I endorse your idea. But 
Um, well, this is kind of a continuation of the first question. We heard what you're wearing, Derek, but um, we didn't get Natalie's answer. So, People oh, are curious, what are you wearing? What sweater? Oh, this is um, this Danish designer who's an artist as well, uh, Henrik Vibskov, who I really like. I have, I wouldn't say a lot of his clothes, but as much of his clothing as I can afford. I've been to his studio a few times and in Copenhagen and I really like him. So it's I got beautiful. it from Eugene Chu, which is a great unisex store in Vancouver. So. Oh, Kevin Heggie just commented. Okay, I can see that. I just want everyone to say that Kevin is a Toronto filmmaker and his movie on the new romantics and squatting and post-punk will be closing the London Queer Film Festival this year. That's a huge achievement. And I got to see a cut of the movie and it has so much Judy Blaine gold in it. I mean, oh, okay. just charming beyond belief. I know you have all these questions, Derek, but I really feel like we all need to manifest that you will sit down with Carol Pope to close that loop from when you were like 12 years old. If everyone Carol here can manifest that you will do a proper sit down with her and talk clothes, I would love I would that. love to do that. I, I, I asked to talk to her when I wrote the essay on Rough Trade, I went over to Kevin and Kevin Staples and Marilyn Kiewit's house. Um, Carol would not write me back. I've only met Carol once at the Wish Book launch of, of my book wish book in 1999 when she walked in i was so afraid that i ran to the bathroom and hyperventilated and my mom had to come basically drag me back up to do the reading i think she had left at that point i mean who wouldn't with this fucking starstruck fag fainting in front of her good okay someone is wondering if uh derek if you've ever tried or had any ubigon fougere or otherwise and if so was it anything it had to be was it everything it had to be? Had any what? <laughs> Bigant, Fougere. I Googled the, the it cologne that I Oscar it Wilde wears. I pronounced it and it appears to be a fragrance. So maybe yeah, um, I'll go on. I have to say that's a great question. I haven't. I'm, I'm like, in terms of fragrance, I have been wearing the same thing for so long. I mean, when I was a teenager, I wore Lagerfeld with the like gay wedding band at the top of the bottle. And then when Natalie, what was that store in Toronto that we loved, that perfume store? Um, Noor? Noor, yeah. Um, so around that time, I was introduced to Zing by L'Artisan Parfumeur, and I have worn that since. I'm down to like half a bottle that's not made with the same stuff anymore, if it's made at all anyway. Um, so no, I have not tried that and it was not everything, but, um, oh, but you just reminded me this writer, Brian Para, an American writer, when I got sick with cancer, he sent me a bunch of, um, little samples of vintage, uh, fragrances that he's been collecting in, in Europe and America. And I got to try Miss Dior for the first time. And I actually got to try some of the original Shocking by Scaparelli, um, it's one of the greatest gifts of my life. And I don't, I haven't talked to Brian in forever, but um, now I feel guilty. All right. Um, Derek, do you have any thoughts on lingerie and do you read Blanchot? <laughs> lingerie. Yeah. Um, I do. <laughs> Need I say who this is from? This is it's probably from Joanne Saul. It's from Kyle. Oh, it's from Kyle. Okay. So um, uh, I do read Blanchot. My thoughts on lingerie are just sexy, I guess. Is I just have sexy thoughts about them. Oh, wait. Do depends count as lingerie? Do, do adult diapers count? In case, if they do, I'm your guy. All right. Um, Derek, You've mentioned ghouls, but please go further along supernatural lines in your discussion. Fashion is undead, but is it also satanic? This is William Jones. Oh, okay, William. <laughs> uh, William has really brought out, my friend William Jones has really brought out the satanic side of me. And in fact, we greet and part now saying, hail Satan. Um, and I'm grateful because I feel like in Canada right now, we're in a real, like Christo fascist state. So um, yeah, he has definitely cultivated uh, the satanic in me. Um, is fashion satanic? Yes, yes. I, I think that that's, but I think I use the words faggy and satanic as synonyms now. And I feel like that's a lot to unpack here. Um, 
But anyway, William, hail Satan. Okay. Um, all right, there are a few questions, nice things. Okay, I'm just gonna read this. Um, this is from James Graham. Congrats on the publication of these amazing essays. Thank so you. much fun to read and a lot of pot of gold chocolates to get through the month of fe February, indeed. That's so um, uh, I love that you gave a shout to um, Fiorucci. In terms of Toronto, does Andrew Pill slash Fab slash Wow resonate with you? It was a moment oh, in time. Who said that? Uh, James Graham. Oh, it was James. Okay. Um, wow was like a really, that was a really exciting place for me. I mean, you would start at Spadina and walk down Queen and the stores that really stick with me are Wow, I guess. I don't know the full history of that. And then Atomic Age. Um, Atomic Age was central to, uh, Atomic Age for, it was um, a boutique next to where the STEM was on Queen Street. Now for people in Toronto, it was the first place in Toronto to carry Vivian Westwood um, when she was still working with Malcolm in the, in the late seventies. Um, uh, Carrie Bondage. I was just talking to someone today about Oh, Micah, Lex here, about how um, the first time I went in, they had the Westwood uh, clothes with the plastic, pink plastic penis um, instead of buttons. Um, and it had this, uh, it had this slanted floor. It was black and white tiled, like it was very racer head, but it, this, the store was falling apart. The people that ran that store went on to run Holt Renfrew, basically, and Ichi in Yorkville. Um, they stayed in fashion forever. That's a story that should be written, Natalie. I should have asked you if I could write that. But part of me, I'm such a chicken shit person. If I'm intimidated by people, I needed Natalie to force me to talk to them because my natural instinct is to run. I hope I answered that. I think you did. Okay. Um, I'd be interested in hearing from both of you about this. There's a person you already mentioned, um, Rachel, who I now is going from GQ to Harper's, but we have a person in the audience who's just wondering uh, what are the best fashion magazines today or magazines that have good fashion writing. And I'd be interested in hearing what both of you have to say about that. Natalie? Oh, geez. Well, you, uh, Corm, loaned me a copy of Viscose, which I think is now in its second issue. And I have to say, I really like that. I, um, there's a, a good place to start if you want kind of an overview and it's not, I don't love the anthology, but it came out last February and it's just called Fashion Criticism. And it has really great selections if you're not into going to find microfiche and finding them yourself um, of Lois Long and, you know, people like uh, writing for Edith Wharton writing on stuff for the delineator and Elizabeth Hawes, who, you know, wrote Fashion is Spinach and Dorothy Todd and Madge Garland, the fabulous lesbians who kind of overhauled Vogue in the twenties, very short lived. Um, and Angela Carter, who wrote about, uh, she wrote this, this essay called The Wound in the Face that was about the, the violence of beauty culture on women that really sticks with me. But I, I think Viscose is a good place to start and Vestage, which is another magazine. And I have reservations about all of them because they tend to be sort of cliquey and funded by, uh, you know, they, fun, you know, they don't pay the writers, I don't think all that much. And that always worries me because it doesn't, it's not a good way to be doing journalism, but I, I enjoyed those, I'd say. And the, like, I like the old stuff personally. Yeah, I would say go to the old stuff, but I do like Viscose and, and Vestos and I guess Wallet would be another one. Um, for me, the writers who are trying to find a non-academic way to talk about fashion are exciting. I have found GQ very entertaining in the last couple of years. And I would also say that there's always something in Luncheon Magazine that's pleasing to me. Um, this oh, new, and- This new issue has a Charlie Porter piece. Um, that made me uh, that made me rethink things uh, about a certain designer. Uh, oh, is it Raph? Is it about Raph? I haven't no, seen Eddie, it Eddie oh. Slimane, uh, because I, I had never really been serious. Think I never taken him seriously, and Charlie takes him seriously and uh, wears him. Um, and 
in terms of fashion writers, I was just telling Natalie, I read an amazing piece by Claire Wilcox. I love Olivier, Say Olivier Sayard. Um, uh, I think there's, you know, there, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say that. I, I and was I, gonna say, oh, back in the day, there was so much, but I'm, I might be full of shit. I don't know. There's also, I, I forgot this other magazine. Um, I don't think of Luncheon as a fashion criticism magazine. It's sort of just lavishly, beautifully produced, but the Skirt Chronicles, which is a periodic yeah. journal is good. And I just got the, the Patrick Kelly book, which they've just updated the Patrick Kelly exhibition that was maybe 10 years old. And it's in San Francisco right now. And they've put out a book to go with it. And there are a lot of crossover um, black academics who are fashion critics, who are working in a more kind of, I don't say commercial, but you know, without the jargon and kind of coming away from the scholarly kind of writing in that book. And so it made me look all of them up and start, start following what they're doing. And, and I, the Patrick Kelly book is just also really well done, but they all have essays in it. And I would recommend that. Yeah. I maybe have one more question to squeeze in for both of you. Um, that relates just asking um, like who in fashion photography appeals uh, to both of you? Oh my God, that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Natalie? <laughs> there it is. I uh, know I'm just trying to think of that. that I'm, I'm blanking on, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Helena Christensen was one of his muses in the 90s and he's just being co-opted to do, I wanna say an H&M or Zara. He just did a Zara. Um, he's a Portuguese photographer, incredibly moody and beautiful. And I'm, I'm just, you know, he still worked. Paulo Reversi, Paulo, okay. yeah. And so I love that kind of, maybe it's cause I'm having 90s nostalgia, but I, I love that. And I, for, you know, one of my favorite things ever is to watch the Being Boring video that Bruce Weber shot for the Pet Shop Boys which is, I know, really loaded, but I just loved his his photography and reading about Annie Flanders, interviews with Annie Flanders about how she gave him work and no one wanted Bruce Weber's kind of photography in the 80s. So she gave him, you know, 60 pages in details and stuff is just amazing to me. So I go back to that. Yeah. I guess I have two quick answers, which aren't like represented in my thought in general, but one, I just saw the um, uh, New York Magazine layout of, um, oh, what's the woman Kanye was dating for like three weeks? Anyway, Jurgen Teller shot her on a dirty pile of snow and I just couldn't believe the cheek of it. Just the cheek of getting, of her lying on this horrible, moldy fucking snow. Um, but I also wanna say as someone who's been, who has been a bookseller for ages and who works at Type Books now that uh, our regular customer and awesome guy, Norman Wong, is like a star in the fashion world and music world as a photographer. And uh, I love that guy. I love him. That's great. Um, I don't know if you guys have any last words to say for now, but uh, on behalf of Type Books, we're super grateful. Um, I just reinserted links in the chat to buy the book. Um, so you can do it online. Um, if you're not local, if you are, all three of our stores have it. This is what it looks like <laughs> before. Cut it up and wear it as a brooch. Yeah, you can wear it as an accessory. We can have yeah. a contest. Wear it as a brooch. The most creative uh, accessory wins a book. Well, I don't know. I want to thank Type um, for stocking it. It might be the only store in Canada that has it. Um, and two, uh, but that's good. That's the only one we need. And two, um, Natalie. I mean, Natalie has not only agreed to do this and talk to me, but she gave me work. You know, yeah. like she kept me housed. Um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, are you making more money now than what, what we originally paid you from the book, do you think? I've never Newspaper made Newspaper rates? I don't, know. I don't know what making money is. What is making money? <laughs> um, no, but not, and, and, and also for like a very long conversation over decades with Natalie about fashion, you know, and uh, we both love it and she keeps me on my toes and there I have other friends that I talk about it all the time with like Vincent Fecto and, and David Altman, but, um, but, you know, uh, and Natalie and I have like very, oh, Ju yeah, Julia Fox, is that Julia Fox, is that her name? Mm -hmm. um, Natalie and I have not the same take on fashion because mine tends to be super theoretical and Natalie has like a real eye for the artisanal for who's making it, but uh, I'm grateful that like I get to learn to do that. 
I mean, it really is like Sadler and Waldorf when we watched the Dior and I. I mean, I would love to do a director's commentary of you and I watching Raf in the room with those petite men. I mean, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation we could do sometime. And Claire, thank <laughs> you for doing this. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor. So thank you both so much. Thanks. Thank you everyone for watching. Everyone now can have um, a Negroni or whatever. Yeah. I love their choice. Bye. Come over, I have some extra. <laughs> Bye everybody, thank you. Bye. Congratulations, Derek. Thank you.